My name is Jessica Thomas, and I am an attorney here in Central Florida, where I own and operate the Thomas Law Firm. I practice in the areas of family law. I also do adoptions, dependency, and guardian ad litem work. I've been an attorney for almost a decade now, and a big chunk of that journey has been dedicated to being a guardian ad litem. In fact, I have been doing guardian ad litem work almost exactly when I started practicing back in 2011 with the Legal Aid Society of Orange County. It was such a different perspective to see a case through solely what was in the best interest of the minor children that I believe it truly helped me to be a more fierce and zealous advocate as a litigator, to be able to come out of my position and truly see what was going to help this family in the long run. In addition to being a guardian ad litem, I had been a mediator for several years until I was appointed by the Florida Supreme Court to our Mediators Qualification and Discipline Review Board for the state of Florida to help assist with the rules and governing procedures for our mediators in the state of Florida. I give you this background to know that today, as I assist in training you on becoming a guardian ad litem, I want you to understand the benefit to doing this not only in a private capacity in domestic matters, but I encourage you to seek out your local legal aid society and assist on a pro bono capacity. The insight and the impact that you will receive from being a guardian ad litem is immeasurable. And I encourage you to take that journey after you watch our video today and feel confident that you have the rules and the tools to move forward in doing your very best for the children subject to any action. I do want to make a point to outline that everything that I'm showing you today is available in our materials. And I made a point to have everything here for you to even see what's available for you online. And I'll try to give you some tips and tools and insights as we go through our training today. Lastly, when uh, in 2018, I was awarded the Elizabeth Susan Corey Guardian Ad Litem of Excellence Award. And receiving that award of excellence truly gave me great, great joy and great inspiration because we all are recognized for being fierce litigators and, you know, prevailing in one different legal matter other or another. But to be recognized for being a guardian ad litem and how many hours and how much dedication we put in to ensuring that we are truly looking out for what's in the best interest of the child uh, was a undescribable feeling. So with that, and now that you know a little bit about me and why I'm here today to assist you in becoming a guardian at litem, let's delve in. First and foremost, we are gonna talk about the statutes and I have everything here for you. You can follow along, you can you know, have your phone. And I think this will help you understand what your role is as a guardian at litem and what is a guardian at litem. So the first statute that we have is Florida Statute 61.401. And this is about the appointment of a guardian ad litem. So when you appoint someone as a guardian ad litem, you are in an action for dissolution of marriage or approval or modification of a parenting plan, which we know as practitioners, those can be paternity cases. The court may appoint a guardian ad litem to act as the next friend of the child investigator or evaluator, not as an attorney or an advocate. Let me stop there just for a moment. There are things called attorney at litems, which you will learn more about in this presentation from one of our other esteemed presenters. But in your role as a guardian at litem, you are not advocating for win or lose, relocate or don't relocate, mom or dad. You are re you are relaying to the court what you have found is in the best interest of the children based on the context of the facts and the documents and the interviews that you have taken in conducting your report. So it's important to remember that 
it's difficult, I think, for some litigators to cut that off and to say, okay, I'm not, you know, going to say that I definitely think mom is right or dad is right. That's not your job. Your job is to be there to say, this is what the children will need. This is what school, I believe, is best for them based on reviewing copious amounts of evidence. So that's first and foremost, Florida Statute 61.401. And to notate that the court in its discretion may appoint legal counsel for a child, that's the attorney at, at litem. However, the guardian and the legal counsel shall not be the same person. In such actions, which involve allegation of child abuse, abandonment, neglect, that's chapter 39, everybody knows dependency, in which an allegation is verified and determined by the court to be well-founded, here's the point, the court shall, hear me, shall. Now, we all know the difference. The may, you're doing a motion, right? You're doing a motion, you're saying, Your Honor, I'm asking you to do this. In dependency court, guardian ad litems shall be appointed. When we're dealing with abuse, abandonment, or neglect, there has to be a voice for that child, period. End of the sentence. So this is important for you to know the distinction between a domestic case and a dependency case to understand that in one, you're seeking the insight of somebody else. In the other, it is a requirement that that person is available to speak on behalf of the children. Now, I want to go just a smidge out of order and go ahead and show you that we have the motion for appointment of a guardian ad litem. That's going to be Florida Supreme Court form 12.942A. Now, I, you know, of course, you know, most of us as practitioners, we draft our own forms, but I wanted you to know that this was available. When I was a baby lawyer, you don't always have the benefit of mentorship. You don't always have the benefit of someone that you can say, hey, I don't understand this, can you help me? So the Florida Supreme Court is a really good skeleton that you can build on and put your own meat. In a motion for appointment of guardian ad litem, you're talking about, you know, of course, what children are subject to the action. You're talking about whether there's been any chapter 39 allegations because that's letting the judge know I must appoint or I may, I shall or I may. Then you're letting the court know what issues you're being asked to review. Are you dealing about parental responsibility? Are you looking at a time sharing schedule? I want to point out to you that guardian ad litems get appointed in all types of cases, but we'll get to that later. I don't want to give you too much, but when this other line, I have seen guardian ad litems rule on drug testing and whether or not they thought the drug testing should be done in front of the children. I have seen guardian ad litems rule on disbursements of funds. I have seen guardian ad litems rule on, you know, whether or not they believe that this child should be able to participate in a certain activity. We always think very grandiose as if it's got to be parental responsibility or time sharing. That's it. That's what guardian ad litems decide on. But that's not it. I want you to open your mind and say, if you guys are truly looking at something that's going to benefit the children and you're at an impasse between the two of you, you need somebody else, a neutral third party, to review the facts and make a recommendation. You also have to, of course, outline how this motion is in the best interest of the children. We'll get to that. That's Florida Statute 6113 about the best interest factors. And then, of course, just your certificate of service. Okay. So that's important for you to know as far as a motion to appoint a guardian ad litem and how within the statute you're able to move forward with your appointment whether it be in a domestic case or dependency matter. Up next, then we have the, the key point of qualifications of a guardian ad litem. Now that's coming from Florida Statute 61.402. If you're following along, of course, this is for CLE credit. So I want you to truly be absorbing what we're talking about. And it's beneficial if you see the same thing as me, because I'm not reading the whole statute verbatim for you. I know that you guys are all practitioners and can review it yourself. So I'm just kind of highlighting the big point. Now, in the qualifications for a guardian ad litem, we have that you need to be certified by a guardian ad litem program. That's uh, pursuant to 39.281 that you're certified by a not-for-profit legal aid organization, which is 68.096, or you're an attorney who is a member of good standing for the Florida Bar. And I understand that this training is for the entire state, 
So whether you're in Dade County, Alachua County, Bay County, Leon County, the benefit of being a legal practitioner is boom, there you are. Let her see. That's it. But I, I implore you, and you're already doing it today, so I guess I don't need to explain you, but I implore you to go to those trainings that your local legal aid society is offering. It has been beneficial. They help you with cases where you're guarding that litem and there's a child with special needs. They help you about reviewing IEP plans and 504s and understanding what children's education concerns need to be. They talk about medication prescribing. Our Orange County Legal Aid Society puts on these amazing lunch and learns. And I will tell you that it has been beneficial not only as a guardian ad litem, but again, the crossover as a practitioner in a guardian ad litem is just day in and day out valued and apparent when you're going to these trainings. So although you're not required to be certified, although that's accurate, I, I really encourage you to do that. And that's part of why you're here today. You have decided that I'm an attorney. I could go to any case that I want right now. Don't even need to do anything. But you want to know more. You want to say, I did this statewide training. I know these statutes. I know these forms. I've seen the reports. I know what I'm supposed to do. And so I applaud you for that. Okay. So now that we know who qualifies as a guardian ad litem, prior to certifying a guardian ad litem pursuant to the not-for-profit legal organization, there must be a certain amount of things done like background checks, things like that. They already have that here. They talk about that the only person who has qualified under a guardian ad litem as a guardian ad litem can be appointed and that it's, of course, a misdemeanor if you misrepresent that you know any of this or that you're a practitioner, which we know, that we know. So I want to, again, go back to the forms for you. This is Florida Supreme Court Form 12.942B, and this is the order appointing guardian ad litem. Now, here's where some practice tips come in. I will tell you that I have seen some phenomenal orders, and this order is important. Now, this is the Florida Supreme Court form, but I want you to know about the phenomenal ones. The phenomenal ones are just like any court order that we as practitioners know. You need to anticipate what's going to happen. You're going to walk into a school and you're going to say, I need to speak with Susie Cates Johnson, this teacher for little Bobby. Okay, well, what allows you to talk to Susie Cates Johnson? Oh, well, I have my order appointing me as guardian at Lida. Well, does it say you can talk to the teachers? Hmm. Does it say that you can review little Bobby's records? Does it say you can make a copy? I know that sounds silly, but I'm being honest with you. The schools, the doctor's offices, everyone that you're going to need to interview, talk to, get the records from, they want to know that they're protected, that they're not exposing themselves to some kind of liability of allowing you access to these things. So it is important that your order is specific. Now, I say for you to start with the Florida Supreme Court order because it clearly outlines back here, you know, what you're allowed to do, what documents you're supposed to be provided, that you're allowed to investigate the allegations, that you can maintain any information, that the parties have trusted you with giving you this information. It goes over each aspect of what you're permitted to obtain. You need to be clear about your role as a guardian at Lida, and this is going to tell you what you can and can't have access to, who you can and can't talk to, who you have to tell what you found or what, and we're gonna get to confidentiality in a second. But it's important, it's important that this order is detailed, expansive, because you don't wanna run into a roadblock. You don't wanna, you, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen until you start doing the interviews, until you start doing the home visits, until you start reading these documents. I will give you an example that in a guardian ad litem case I had, there was an issue with one of the witnesses that did not speak English. And so I needed a translator, but I was concerned about whether or not I had the ability to just get my own translator, whether or not I had to tell them I was going to use the translator for this other interview. I had to be concerned about the cost of the translator. There were something that you just wouldn't think of, like something as basic as, you know, I needed to talk to this witness. If there had been some very good specifics of what I'm supposed to do for outside costs, sometimes that comes up. What happens when you go to 
the criminal records and you want to print this whole file, something like that. And they say, oh, that's going to be 10 cents a page. Are you supposed to pay for that and then invoice it? Do the clients need to provide you with the documents? How long do they have to provide you with the documents? Do you have to give a copy to the opposing counsel? Do you have to give a copy to the person who hired you? What am I supposed to do? This is the order. Read the order. Details, details. Ask other guardian ad litems. Hey, what, is, what have you found has been an issue? So you can be sure that you're addressing it in your order appointing, that you're making sure that you have a clear understanding, okay? The last thing, of course, that's in here is that it does have automatic in the Florida Supreme Court form. The guardian ad litem is automatically discharged without further order of the court for 30 days after a final judgment on this proceeding. You want to be sure to check that out. Um, the, the reason I say that is because what can happen is you can get automatically discharged. Someone does a motion to set aside, not a motion for, you know, not an appeal within those 30 days, but a motion to set aside. They got to reappoint you and go through the whole process. So just think about those kind of hiccups that can come. Also, and again, we're going to get to this. You got to talk about what you're going to do for hearsay. Now, in the order, and this is a, a dice roller, as we know as practitioners, I don't know what the guardian ad litem is going to say. So if I put that we are waiving hearsay for this report, if I put as the practitioner that this report is automatically going to be introduced into evidence, any party can rely upon there. If I'm going to put that type of language, what if it's not in my favor? And now I'm stuck with this report. You really need to think about, as a practitioner, what's going to be in the best interest of your client. Now, as the guardian ad litem, I, of course, you know, I, I want everything waived. I want my report in because I want the court to hear from me. Now, they can call you as a witness, of course, but you want this detailed report that you've made that, you know, 10, 20, 50 pages long. You want it to have... Um, some weight and credibility, the detail, you want to be able to have that available for the parties and for the court. But that's something that needs to be addressed or you're going to be in a position where as a practitioner, you've done all this work, your client has paid this money and then they're not able to utilize what they have. Okay, I want to make sure I'm staying on time. Okay, next we are going to talk about Florida Statute 61.403. This goes over the guardian ad litem's powers and authority. Again, I'm not reading things to you guys. We only have 50 minutes today. You are intelligent practitioners, intelligent community members. I know that you will read through this. It's important. Again, I'm giving you the highlights. Some of the highlights are that the guardian ad litem may assist the court in obtaining impartial expert examinations. This is important, as we all know, for child support to go past the age of uh, majority. Let's say we're getting a special needs designation and I need an expert that's going to show that this child's going to be dependent for, you know, the foreseeable future. I, as the guardian ad litem, may say, hey, this is who I think is going to be able to give us that determination that then I can say who's going to be better equipped to handle whatever this expert recommendations are. I'll be able to say, I think Susie Cakes Johnson, Dr. Susie Cakes, is going to be able to tell us who and what we need to be considering for little Bobby or little Susie in their special needs designation. That's a good one to recognize. Also here, the guardian ad litem through counsel. Now this is important and I've run into this before early on in my career. There was questions about whether or not the guardian ad litem needed their own attorney. Pursuant to the statute, they do. It says the guardian ad litem through counsel, clear as day, we're in section two, may petition the court for an order directed to a specified person, agency, or organization, including but not limited to hospitals, medical doctors, dentists, psychologists, and psychiatrists, which order directs the guardian ad litem to be allowed to inspect and copy, there goes that order, any records and documents which relate to the minor child or to the child's parents or other custodial persons or household members with whom the child resides. Such order shall be obtained only after notice to all parties and hearing thereon. So the guardian ad litem, remember what it said. This, the, you know, that's why we're going in this order. You're not an advocate. You're not supposed to sit there in a role and say, this is why I want to talk to this hospital today. That's not it. You need somebody else sitting there, a lawyer, sitting there saying, 
this is what the cardiac wife needs to talk to this hospital today. But I submit to you that had you really made sure this order was super specific in the beginning, you would need to file a subsequent motion unless something different comes up. I'm not saying that it's like an example with the calculator or there are at times that you may be doing a home visit and you realize that there's a drug issue or that one of the parents has a mental health issue that you didn't know about and you really need to get those records and that wasn't anticipated because nobody knew that mom or dad had this issue. So I suggest that you review 61403 and make sure that your order initially has as much of it as the parties will agree to and then subsequently as issues arise they can be brought before the court. Um, it does talk about that of course you're able to review all the pleadings, talk to the witnesses, it is my experience that what I like to do is have through their counsel submit to me what they want. So that's what my starting place. I already know the pleadings. I've, I've already you know reviewed those. I want you to submit to me what you think I need to know for your position. So you have exhibits you want me to see. You have text messages, calendars. I get photos. Um, and then you give me the list of who you want me to talk to. And I think it's important to know those things ahead of time. I usually ask on those initial consultations when I'm being retained for a guardian at Leiden position. What is it that, how many people do you want me to talk to? What is the timeline? That's really important. Very important practice tip. Understand the timeline of your parties. If they're expecting you to be ready for a motion for temporary relief, you need to know that. If they're expecting you to just be ready for trial, you need to know that. If they're expecting you to be ready in one of those quick turnaround relocation hearings before a temporary relocation, you need to know that. So that you can plan accordingly and really focus on getting done everything that is being requested of you. You don't want to come into a situation where you're seen as impartial because you had an opportunity to review all of the petitioner's witnesses, but not all the respondent's witnesses. That's going to not bode well. So make sure that you're managing your time. Make sure you know your expectations. Make sure you know what powers and authorities you have so you don't have to run into continued delays to separate motions later on. Okay, next, 61.404. This one I am going to read to you. It's only a smidge. Look how little. Okay, guardian ad litem's confidentiality. The guardian ad litem shall maintain, shall, I wish I had like, you know, little graphics, shall, all bold, and I would probably say it in that overarching voice, shall like that the guardian ad litem shall maintain as confidential all not some not part all information and documents received from any source described in florida statute 61.4032 now remember we had 403 432 is when they talk about the guardian ad litem through counsel and petition this is for the records household members, wherever you're getting information, remember, they interlineate, and may not disclose such information or documents except in the guardian ad litem's discretion in a report to the court served upon both parties to the action and their counsel or as directed by the court. Have you guys ever heard of that phrase, cone of silence, the cone of silence, or even better in that one movie, what was it, Circle of Trust, is that it, the Circle of Trust, this is this, and I, I give you guys examples because I want you to, to remember, you know how in mediation, the reason that we all say it's confidential is because I don't want to make the offer that, hey, look, I'm basically willing to give you all the kids every day if I don't have to pay any child support, that's what, you know, could happen. I don't want to look bad in court later because I don't want to say that in court. In court, I'm going to be the premier parent and I want my children all the time because I love them. Nobody can use against you what you said, right? I, that same premise and principle is there for guardian ad litems. I want Susie Cakes Johnson to tell me everything. Tell me why you think dad's not great. Tell me why you think Nana and Pop Pop are the ones who care for the child every day. Tell me why you think that mom is back, you know, has fallen off the wagon from her substance abuse. Tell me why. And I don't want you to be afraid that I'm going to call you on the carpet 
and say, it's Susie Cage Johnson. That's why I'm deciding that the kids should be with dad and not mom. You don't want that. You want people to be free and forthcoming. I want the teacher not to be afraid that she's the one who said that homework log is never signed by dad. Only uh, the other parent, only uh, is top is the only person who signs the homework log. And then that teacher still has to see those kids. She still has to go to that school. This is phenomenal. This is your protection. This is one of your powers and duties is confidentiality. It's important to remember, it's gonna give you some peace of mind when you're going through the process. Okay, also peace of mind right here. One of the last kind of, of these connected statutes, which is the 61.401 through 0.405. Here's our last one. 61.405, any person participating in a judicial proceeding as a guardian ad litem shall, there we go. Again, I wish I had a graphic. Shall, shall be presumed prima facie to be acting in good faith and in so doing shall be immune from any liability, civil or criminal, that otherwise might be incurred or imposed. It's right there in black and white. Oh, I do love the law. Is that why we all became lawyers? I love it. I love it. I love it. It's thought out. It's protecting you. You are allowed to do your job without the fear that someone's going to sue you later. Now, I, and now let me let me talk to you plain, like how we talk to clients. This is the law. That doesn't mean that people don't break it. So that doesn't mean that pro se litigant Tommy Bopskins is not going to send you a civil suit because he thinks that you're working with the government. Don't, that, that can still happen. It can still happen. It just means you're going to have a good defense. Okay. All right. Now we've gone over the statutes. We've gone over some of our Supreme Court forms. Let's talk about Florida Statute 6113, and we're doing good. We're about halfway through. Now, um, I'm going to go on a limb and say that everybody knows about 6113, but if you do not, this is like our Bible as domestic attorneys. We know these statutes in and out, and we know these factors in and out. These are the best interest factors. Now, as you all know, I think it was in 2008 that we got rid of our whole primary residential custody, and we moved forward towards parental responsibility and dis, um, and time sharing. So for parental responsibility, you often as a guardian at litem will be asked to choose what method of parental responsibility will be best for the children. Now we all know there's a presumption that shared parental responsibility is best, but I submit to you that I've been, it's I'm a, a really big litigator. So in addition to my guardian at litem work, adoptions and dependency, my family law cases are really contentious and uh, complex, and I'm usually in court a lot for them. That being said, it's beneficial to hear some of our newer judges on the bench who talk about shared parenting. You've got to be able to talk. And it's good that they're, they're truly looking at the application. And that's you. That's you also as the guardian ad litem. You can't just say, oh, shared parenting is the default, and so that's what I'm going to do. No. Is this going to work for this family? If you have two people who can't say the sky is blue, like can't look up. One person says it's blue and white and there's some yellow from the sun. No, nope, it's just blue, you liar. If you have people like that, how are they supposed to confer and jointly make decisions? How? And the judges now are saying that. They're not just defaulting. They're not just defaulting to parental responsibility being shared. They're saying, you know what? No, nope, I'm going to go and give Susie Cakes Johnson ultimate decision making. They're saying it. They're saying, not soul, we'll talk about that in a second, but the ultimate decision making over education. She's the one who has the kid all the school year. And so we're not going to let Bob Joe come in here and say, oh, I don't like that teacher and I think you should switch him. No, you don't even know the teachers. Same thing for the parents with a special needs child. And the one parent has been the one who's gone to all the trainings, knows how to change all the, the, um, 
the mechanics for if the child is on kind of breathing machine or knows all their medications, has been to all their doctor's appointments, knows who the caregivers are, what they should be doing. No, I'm not letting you make medical decisions because you don't know and you guys can't talk. So as a guardian at Lightham, when you read through Florida Statute 6113, you need to really understand the real world application of what you're recommending. So if you recommend shared parental responsibility with ultimate decision making, A, we all know you can't just say that outright. The case law doesn't allow that. We can't just be like, ultimate decision making for the rest of your life. No, tell people what it is. Ultimate decision making over education, over religion, over health, over extracurricular. What are you telling this one specific area where someone's, FYI, constitutional fundamental rights that rear their child are now going to be limited? Tell them how and why. That's the parental responsibility. When you're considering the best interest of the child, you are considering how those, who's going to be the decision maker about what, and you need to decide, does there need to be a trump? Part of that? Does there need to be someone's decision who trumps the other? If so, then say that and say why in your report. Also, you have to have the aspect of is sole parental responsibility best in this? What if you're a guardian ad litem appointed where there's been someone who's in prison for, I don't know, next 10 years? Do you think as a guardian ad litem that they should still get to make choices? You can call him on the phone. You can call her on the phone. What, what's the difference? You don't get to see me in real life. <laughs> in real life, we're not going to meet each other at Starbucks to make a decision about little Timmy's basketball. We're calling each other. Do you think he should be on basketball? Oh, I don't think he should be on basketball. Well, dadgummit, can't you just call me at the prison? Actually, I don't think you can. I don't think you can just call at the prison. Actually, I, think, I actually don't think you can call. But doesn't mean that you can't send me a letter. And I can't call you back. But you and I both know there's some delays. You know, I'm giving a little bit of jest, so we're not bored during this 50 minutes. But it's it's important to know that you're having someone here who can be available, responsive, and sincere in their thoughts for their child. So as the guardian ad litem, are you just going to say, no, mom doesn't get to make any of the decisions because she's in prison? Or are you going to say, you know, no, I still think they need shared with ultimate. You got to try to reach out to mom. I've had a case where I, uh, as a litigator, where sole parental responsibility was the most appropriate. And I was very excited that the court agreed with me. Uh, not a case, of course, there's several cases, but this particular case stands out because it was about non-responsiveness. And as a guardian at Lightham, think of how many times that is what comes up. I reach out to that person, they don't respond. I reach out to that person, they don't respond. That comes up all the time. We all know that. And you're the guardian at Lightham. You're the one who's going to be looking through all these text messages and say, oh, hmm, you know what? They're really not responsive. And if I'm asking you if little Susie Cakes needs her tonsils out, kind of need you to respond a little sooner. So I encourage you to learn these factors. Um, and be prepared to make a recommendation on shared parental, shared with ultimate decision making. Sometimes they'll call it uh, shared with primary decision making. And then, of course, sole parental responsibility, which I always give the example as one is, do you think little Bobby should go to basketball? I do. I don't. OK, we can't agree. Too bad. Do you think little Bobby should do basketball? I do. I don't. Well, I do. And I have ultimate decision making over extracurricular. So he is. Or do you think little Bobby should do it? Oh, wait, I didn't ask anybody. I just signed little Bobby up for basketball. That's how you can think of the three. Now, over here on the factors, they're going to go A through T. So just here all the way through, they always have that T of any other factor that's relevant. For me, I have found it's beneficial as a guardian at Lightem to make a chart. And I kind of make like a chart that has all the best interest factors. What one side is alleging about mom? or mom and mom or dad and dad, but what one side is alleging about one party and what they're alleging about the other. And then I have my factors and I'm going through and reviewing them kind of on a side by side. It helps me and I make sure it's included in my report. It helps me to make sure that I'm not missing anything. And then I'm truly saying like, this is a factor good for this parent. And this is a factor good for this parent. You know, I have a parent, let's say who has four DV cases. Obviously, the DV factor is not good for them. 
On the other hand, the other person maybe doesn't have any DV injunctions, but they have like a huge criminal case, tons of criminal records. Maybe that factor is not good for them. And then it gives me almost a quantifiable way for me to have a starting place to say, okay, well, out of these factors, 20 of them are bad for you and the rest are good for them. So it gives me a way to kind of quantify and I like that. So I encourage you, make a chart, make what works for you, make a worksheet so that as you're getting facts and you're gathering information, you can even kind of, as you're getting everything, put it in your respective files. This is a moral conduct factor. This is a delegation of third parties factor. This is a stability factor. Oh, you know, I have 18 leases from grandma of, of where dad lived 18 different times. It helps you. Although again, we know you can't use that with people. Everyone knows case law, but I'm just giving you an example. Okay, so that's 6113. Now let's talk a smidge about 6113001, parental relocation. So you know as a guardian ad litem in just a standard domestic case, paternity, dissolution of marriage, modification, you're going to be relying on your factors. And honestly, you rely on these factors all the time. It's not just in those cases. It's also in the relocation factors, but you also have additional things to consider. That's it. So think of these two together. Okay. So 6113.01, the biggest thing to remember about relocation is it is not about you, Bobby. And it's not about you, Susie. How many times have you read these petitions for relocation? I need to move because I got a new job and I don't have a support system here and I'm really lonely and I, 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 me, me, me. In our song, me, 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 all about you. It's not. As a guardian at litem, thank God you get to say, no, this is the worst move ever for this kid. The child loves their school. They're making straight A's. They have siblings here. Dad is super involved. He sees him. They have equal time. And you want me to let you move to where? To California? How is that in the best interest of the child? I know it's going to be fantastic for you. How is it in the best interest of little Bobby and little Susan and little Tiffany and little Lucy Kate? How? So when you're looking at parental relocation, you have to go through those considerations of whether this move is better. Now, again, remember I mentioned to you that I like to, I put a little bit of responsibility on the parties when I'm appointed and back to what's in that order. See, we're all, we're just building and building. I put that responsibility on the parties to help me understand what is it? Give me the documents. Is it that Bobby Cakes is doing horrible in this school and there's a school in Idaho that is much better and the classroom sizes are smaller? Tell me, is it that, you don't have support and thus that's affecting little Bobby. Little Bobby's left at school at night. Like, tell me what it is. Help me see it in black and white. So you can have them provide you with statements. You're doing your interviews. They can give you the school records. But here's the key point. When in a petition for relocation, they have to tell us where they're going. And it's right here. Just come on back to petition to relocate. When you're reading this, it's telling you the telephone number of the new resident, when they're going to move detailed specific reasons for the proposed relocation, a proposed relocation schedule for access and time sharing. P.S. People don't always follow this, which is frustrating as a practitioner and causes motions to dismiss. But more importantly, as a guardian at litem when you're in a relocation case, I need this information. Back to you're not an advocate. You get the petition. It's missing these things, right? It's not your job and it's not your role to say, your Honor, FYI, they didn't follow the statute, so I think you should just miss that. Not your job, Susan. Not your job. Your job is ask that person asking to move. Hey, look, I have to make a recommendation of what's in the best interest of the children, and I need to make a recommendation of whether this relocation is in their best interest. Could you get me where you're going to live? Could you tell me who lives there? Could you, could you get me some of these things? That's what you're asking. That's it, okay? Not your job to interject in the court. Your job is to get this information you need to be compliant with the statute. Okay, we're doing fantastic. All right, parenting plan. So again, Florida Supreme Court has parenting plan available for you. That's gonna be form 12.995A. The standard parenting plan, as we all know, it has all of the little check markers. 
What are you doing? Is this established by the court? Where's everybody live? I think this is phenomenal for if you're making a recommendation of what a good parenting plan should be, if they submit dueling parenting plans to you and you need to look at them, I suggest that you go ahead and grab the initials form 12.995A, go through it and make sure all of these things are in it. You can, you know, as a practitioner, and you also know from your experience, I'm sure, there are plenty of times we all get a parenting plan to work on the modification and say, so what did you guys decide about caregivers? Oh, it's not in here. What did you guys decide about where you're going to meet for the child? Oh, it's not in here. What did you decide about when you can call little Susie or Johnny? Oh, it's not in here. Take the parenting plan, the initial form, compare it to what you're being proposed by either side, or if they've asked you as the guardian at litem to make a recommended parenting plan, be sure that you're including the bare minimum, which is from the Florida Supreme Court form. As I mentioned earlier, most of us have our own forms, and so we go through it and we already have what we're going to say as far as, you know, uh, like I try to include specific things about like the taxes, about providing income information, because as a practitioner, I'm thinking ahead for motions for contempt. I'm thinking ahead about people's income information. I put a lot of prevailing party language in it. Of This is what happens if you do this. I've been taught a lot at these CLEs to really make sure you're giving the judges alternatives. Don't just say, well, if Bobby breaks it, we want you to enforce it. Well, if he breaks it five times, I also would like for you to just invade his 401k, give us that money. Go ahead and say those kind of things. As the guardian at litem, you're not advocating like myself and as a practitioner in my forms, but what you are making sure is that you're preemptively thinking about what could happen for this child. What happens if you put in your parenting plan that they get telephone contact at eight o'clock every day, but then lo and behold, mom or dad takes the phone as discipline. What is everybody supposed to do? You're the guardian at litem. Think of the best interest of the child. Is them, isn't it in their best interest for them to have contact with mom and dad? Isn't that good for them? Yes. Okay. So now you know it's good for them. How about you plan for that in your parenting plan? Make sure you have some contingencies. So start there. The supervised safety focus plan. This one, again, this is still in 63. So this is where we're in a domestic case. We all know that in a dependency case, that's going to be completely different. There's going to be a, um, a case plan that the parent with their regional counsel or if they have private counsel is going to be working through and that there's going to be motions for reunification, motion for contact, motion for time sharing, motion for out-of-state contact. We all know that's going to go through the department and their case management system. Here, when there's just a, an element of some supervised safety, for example, I've had cases where you had one parent with severe mental health issues, and we want to make sure that mom or dad is taking their medication. We want to make sure they're in compliance with their treatment plan. We want to make sure that we have access to those records, that they're not going to raise a HIPAA ob objection to us. Um, these things right here are good to consider for a supervised safety focus plan. And I say, again, as the guardian at litem, whether or not you're being asked to make a recommendation on submitted parenting plans to you, or if you're being asked to create a recommendation of what the parenting plan is, you have got to make sure that you're starting with the skeletons of the Florida Supreme Court forms, because otherwise you're going to miss something. It's, you know, brand new starting out, you will miss something. We all know with experiences how we continue to expand what we would include. For example, in the safety plan, there's things like access to activities. Okay, we have somebody who's coming to the soccer games. How are we doing it? Can you go on one day? Can I go on the other? Children's safety, no alcoholic beverages, no firearms. How are we doing the discipline? That is a consistent concern. Oh, I don't want you to spank. Well, in the state of Florida, you're allowed to spank. So is that you don't want me to spank? And if so, then you need to put it in writing because otherwise I'm protected to do it. Okay, supervised safety focus plan. That's Florida Supreme Court Form 12.995B. Then, of course, we talked about relocation. The relocation plan is form 12.995C. This relocation plan, again, I am imploring you that as you are going through your recommendation, you consider these things in your report. I know that the reports take a long time, right? I write them. I know they take a long time. But it's beneficial because when you're reading it, 
initially that initial reaction that initial gut of what you think is good for this child or not it's going to be cumbersome to go back and i mean just think we've only been on this for 44 minutes look how much we've gone through you're the guardian at light up don't you think that mom and dad are going to inundate you with like tons of paperwork and interviews so when you're really sitting down to make a recommendation it helps to have like a checklist which is why i mentioned for the best interest factors that checklist have a chart have some kind of summary or guideline that you can follow. The Supreme Court forms are really good for, again, just reminders of what you want to do. Who's paying for these flights? Can Bobby Joe fly alone? What happens if there's a national pandemic? Is Bobby Jones still going to fly? Bobby Jones not going to fly? Bobby Jones getting on a train. Who's paying for the train? Who's keeping little Bobby Joe's super uh, passport? Can I apply for a new passport? What are we going to do if little Susie Cakes wants a dual citizenship? Mom wants to apply for that. Is that in little Susie Cakes' best interest? These are the things to consider when we talk about relocation, when we talk about any parenting plan, and recommending the same for the children. All right. Now, we are doing phenomenal. I will tell you, we are at the last five minutes, so you can feel like, woo, got through the first session mm, of the CLE. Mm. We're doing it. Okay. Guardian Elida initial report. So I pulled one of my old reports just to kind of go over to you what I include. I always outline who they asked me to interview and whether or not I got to do those interviews. So I start with what I reviewed and I put all this in my report and everybody's different. The same way there's different practitioners, there's different guardian items. I am a little bit type A OCD. It helps me, again, to be able to say, nope, this is where I saw it. This is where I got it from. So I outline every single document that was given to me. Think of an index. I put like a table of contents index in here. I outline every single person that they asked me to interview. I outline when I interviewed that person, what the relationship was. I outline all the medical professionals, what information I received, what documents I reviewed. I outline my home visits. And I go through the best interest factors, like I mentioned to you, line by line, factor by factor, of whether or not this was good for mom. In this case, it was mom and dad, mom and dad, mom and dad, what was good for them, what was not. I go over what documents are interlineated, why I chose this, what was helpful to me, what was not helpful. If I have any updates, then I outline that. Hey, look, I since I've written this report, you can do supplemental reports. Don't forget that. You can do supplementative reports. You can amend your report. You can do preliminary reports. The sky is the limit. I know people think that it's just one and done and you make your recommendation and that's it. Guardian at items are a party to the case. I can't tell you how many times you have clients who reach out and say, I want the guardian at item to know this. The guardian at item said I was supposed to have Tuesdays and Thursdays. Everybody, you know, the judge agreed with the recommendation, made it a court order. And I want the guardian at item to know she's breaking this. And it was on a temporary basis. I want her to know before she makes her final recommendation. So you may have updates. You may have supplemental reports. I did outlining on my recommendation of the residence where I thought the child should reside. That was what I was asked for. Again, in my order, I knew what I was being asked of. I knew what specifically, remember that order of pointing that we talked about. And it said, what did you want the guardian at litem? What are they talking about? What did you want the guardian at litem to make a recommendation on? I can't just have like an open-ended, we just want you to tell us what you think. No, what do you want me to tell you about specifically? Make that qualification for yourself and that standard. So I was asked to recommend where the child should reside. I made that recommendation. I was asked to recommend a time-sharing schedule, and I made that recommendation. So this is one of my past reports. And so again, I think we'll have a redacted version in the materials for you all. This is the time that I would ask for, of course, any questions, but instead I'm gonna give you a couple of tips for our last two minutes, which some of the uh, tips are. One, I suggest that you do your interviews first before you read the documents. That's my tip. It helped me frame things. Now everybody's different, right? For me, I didn't want to go in with a preconceived notion of like, I read your text messages. I see that you're a controlling person or what have you. Or I've read the school records. I know that little Bobby's failing. You can lie to me if you want. I appreciated doing the interviews first 
of those people they requested, the teachers, the cousins, the, the friends, it helped me. After I do the interviews, then I did the document review. And then from that, I did my site visits. And that order just helps me funnel it, come up with what works for you. Also, a tip that I will give you is to make sure that you understand how these real world examples, like I mentioned for guardian ad litems, it can be more than just domestic cases. I have had cases, like I said, where you make recommendations on funds, on people's money, on settlements, on PI cases and guardianship cases. So be allow yourself to know that there are some additional ways that you can create revenue as a private guardian ad litem, and it will assist you in making sure that you are expanding, again, your experience. So I won't keep you any longer. Like I said, my name is Jessica Thomas, owner and operator of the Thomas Law Firm here in Central Florida, where I service all neighboring counties in the areas of family law, guardian ad litem, adoption law, dependency, anything domestic comes to me. I am so happy to have been able to talk with you today. And I appreciate your time. I appreciate you joining us for this certified legal education credit. And if you have any questions, my information is probably on the materials. And I'd be happy to help you, give you some insight. Give me a call. Jessica Thomas, Thomas Law Firm.